Good afternoon. I'd like to start out by um, personally thanking Dr. Olivier for inviting me out here. Um, it's an honor to be out here and uh, having the opportunity to present my research, so thank you. And the title of my project is Chronic Altitude Training Reduces the Oxygen Cost of Exercise Hyperpnea. Previous research has established a curvilinear relationship between uh, pulmonary minute ventilation and respiratory muscle oxygen uptake <clears throat> here on the, on the y-axis as shown in this graph. During heavy to maximal exercise, highly trained distance runners typically ventilate at levels which exceed about 150 liters per minute. And at these exercise ventilations, typically small increases in VE are associated with very large increases in the oxygen cost of breathing. And furthermore, with altitude training, <clears throat> when highly trained uh, athletes live and train at moderate altitudes, we see an increase in the hypoxic ventilatory response, indicating an increase in ventilatory drive, which typically manifests as an increase in ventilation at altitude. And the graph on the right here shows an example of a study we recently did in a group of elite distance runners, um, which shows an increase in ventilation at maximal exercise from pre to post altitude. So we reasoned that if exposure to hypoxia leads to an increase in the ventilatory drive to breathe, and therefore we see an increase in the ventilation um, at altitude, then presumably at any given exercise workload, we see an increase in the work of breathing at altitude compared to at sea level. And we asked, what effect does this have on the oxygen cost of breathing? And we reasoned that the stimulus would be similar to what is seen with inspiratory muscle training, and in fact, Louise Turner in our lab collected data on a group of 16 trained male cyclists who did six weeks of pressure threshold inspiratory muscle training at a frequency, duration, and intensity that had previously been shown to um, improve performance. And we measured the oxygen cost of breathing pre and post inspiratory muscle training at relative workloads of 50%, 75%, and 100% of VO2 max. And as a result, We've got respiratory muscle oxygen consumption on the y-axis, denoted by VO2RM. And at 75% of VO2 max, we saw a 27% decrease in the oxygen cost of breathing. And at 100%, we saw a 32% decrease in the oxygen cost of breathing. So based on these results, we asked, does chronic altitude training decrease the oxygen cost of exercise hyperpnea in trained distance runners? So we conducted a, a pilot study using six elite male distance runners. We measured the resting hypoxic ventilatory response. We measured ventilatory and metabolic variables at three submaximal exercise workloads, as well as at max. And we measured the oxygen cost of breathing, which required the subjects to come in uh, to the lab for a second lab visit, where they mimicked exercise ventilation. And uh, we estimated the oxygen cost of breathing by taking the difference between total body VO2 during the mimic trials and subtracting total body VO2 during baseline standing rest. And just to give you a better example of our ventilatory mimic setup, I'll explain that further on the next slide. So our athletes participated in 28 days of a modified live high train low model where they lived at 2,100 meters and then they did their uh, low intensity, more base type training in and around that same moderate altitude. And then they did their high intensity interval training at a lower altitude, um, more specifically elevations of 900 to about 1100 meters in elevation. Then when the subjects came back, we took the same measurements as pre-altitude in the first and second days um, following return to sea level. And again, just to give you a better idea of our ventilatory mimic setup, on the inspiratory side, we have a tank with 5% CO2 to prevent the subjects from becoming hypocapnic during the mimic trial, uh, an O2 composition similar to ambient, com uh, ambient conditions at sea level, and balanced nitrogen, 
We fed that onto a bag reservoir for mixing. And also on the inspiratory side, we had a, uh, a humidifier for keeping the air from getting too dry for breathing comfort during the mimic. We used a metronome for matching breathing rates during the mimic to what we observed during exercise. We had a computer screen which displayed a graph for matching tidal volume. And then on the right side here, we have our metabolic and flow volume equipment. And briefly, it's important to note that pulmonary minute ventilation, tidal volume, breathing frequency, and expiratory reserve volume, just to have sort of a gauge of operating lung volumes, were all well matched between exercise and mimic <clears throat> during submaximal exercise and maximal exercise for both pre pre-altitude and post-altitude. Now these numbers represent maximal exercise, and I know it's a lot to take in at once, but if you just glance at the numbers between exercise and mimic for each, you can see that those numbers are matched pretty well. And in fact, there were no statistically significant differences detected between the two. So as expected, we found an increase in the hypoxic ventilatory response from pre to post altitude, as indicated by a significant increase and the slope describing the relationship between um, arterial oxygen saturation and resting ventilation, indicating an increase in ventilatory drive at altitude. And what we found, again, here we have VO2RM on the y-axis, what we found was a 10% decrease in the oxygen cost of breathing at a workload corresponding to about 75% of VO2 max, and then at max, we found a, about a 12% decrease in the oxygen cost of breathing. Okay, and just for comparison on the right here, um, this is the graph that I showed you earlier from Louise Turner's study. And just looking at these two graphs, as you can see, it appears that chronic altitude training seems to elicit the same response in terms of the oxygen cost of breathing as inspiratory muscle training. And furthermore, these data points represent our three uh, submaximal exercise workloads as well as max. And on the x-axis here, we have pulmonary minute ventilation that represents uh, mimic ventilation. And then VO2RM on the y-axis. And as you can see, in our athletes from pre-altitude to post-altitude, at each workload, we see a decrease in the oxygen cost of breathing. And as shown uh, before, the statistical differences were detected at the higher submaximal workload and then at max. And then again, just for comparison, here we have our pre-inspiratory muscle training group, and then post-inspiratory muscle training. So as you can see from this graph, it appears that chronic altitude training seems to attenuate the disproportionate increase in the oxygen cost of breathing at high ventilatory workloads. So again, in summary, chronic altitude training reduces the oxygen cost of exercise VE at 75% and 100% of VO2 max. And we reason that uh, the added work of breathing during exercise for 28 days of altitude training uh, provided a training response to the, res the respiratory musculature such that we see an improvement in breathing economy. Okay. Now, what does this mean for exercise performance? Well, we think that it's possible that, um, especially at maximal exercise, that a decrease in the oxygen cost of breathing would indicate an increase in the locomotor muscle O2 availability. And as Dr. Rahman um, described yesterday and also uh, Ryan uh, alluded to earlier, um, it's been shown before that, uh, by Dr. Craig Harms that an increase in the work of breathing um, results in an increase in leg vascular resistance and therefore an attenuation of blood flow. And it also works the other way, where if you reduce, reduce the work of breathing, you increase leg blood flow. And we think that this uh, respiratory muscle metaboreflex, metaboreflex may play a role in what we're seeing here. However, unfortunately, we didn't actually have work of breathing measurements, so we can't necessarily um, comment on changes in the oxygen cost of breathing as reflective of changes in the work of breathing. However, this would be a very good measure to have in future studies, um, sort of it, you know, getting to the bottom of what's going on here with chronic altitude training as a training stimulus um, for the respiratory musculature.
couple other um, possible limitations. Um, respiratory muscle fatigue, perception of breathing are also a couple of uh, variables that we didn't have with our study uh, that may be helpful in future studies, uh, sort of helping get, get to the bottom of the changes in oxygen cost of breathing with chronic altitude training as a form of inspiratory muscle training. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to comment on just a, a, a limitation to our study that we typically see with most studies with elite, um, using elite athletes. Um, our N was fairly small. We only had six subjects. However, later on this year, we're planning on taking a separate group of elite distance runners to altitude, same elevation, same training, taking the same measures pre and post altitude, and hopefully adding that data to our current preliminary data and um, thus creating a greater N, and hopefully by the end of the year we'll be able to comment further on, on these measurements. And lastly, I'd like to thank my research team as well as uh, the organizations who uh, contributed to the funding. Thank you. Any question from the floor? Yeah, there you go. Uh, thank you, uh, Philip. It's a very nice presentation. Daniel, sorry, nice presentation. Uh, do you think that it would be useful to have a sort of block training regarding the respiratory muscles? I mean, to have a, a, respira a respiratory muscles training first, and then after taking the boys to altitude. Or we can also uh, discuss about the combination of respiratory muscle training during altitude training. That the, the the protocol that you uh, showed is very ingenious, and uh, yeah, really congratulations for that. But uh, then it raised a lot of uh, practical questions. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely a next step. Um, that's a really good idea, is seeing you know, how inspiratory muscle training itself would affect the oxygen cost of breathing in the same group of athletes um, that we used with altitude training. That's a really good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea for a future study, for sure. Yeah, yeah, wonderful study. Um, just as, um, as far as an applied um, pre, say, competition or training, um, when you come across like pre-activation potentiation, how would you what, are you, what are your thoughts on, say, doing some respiratory muscle training before an event to help reduce the cost of breathing in the actual event itself? Do you think there could be a transference there and maybe a modality to help pre-competition? Uh, well, first of all, I should comment by saying that's a, a little bit out of my area. I'm not really sure um, if I'm able to comment on that. Um, but essentially, you know, what we're talking about here is more um, a chronic training effect. And, you know, in this case, it's four weeks of chronic altitude training or six weeks of inspiratory muscle training. Um, and again, you know, we presume that the issue is what, what's going on is there's some sort of a training effect that's altering the structure of the muscles or changing breathing patterns um, that's causing a decrease in the oxygen cost of breathing. Um, it, and it's either that or, you know, typically with altitude training, we see an increase in hemoglobin mass. Um, perhaps if the, in these athletes, if we did see an increase in hemoglobin mass, then there would have been a training effect. Um, so, you know, in this case, we're talking a little bit more about a chronic effect. Um, so. yeah, Daniel, well, yeah, nice work. I just Thanks. wanted to maybe relate your work back to, to Rob's work, the performance sort of outcome. At, sure. at, at max, you seem to be changing the work of breathing from um, seven and a half mils mm -hmm. per kilo down to 6.8 or something, 12% sure. reduction. But that's got to be, you know, seven out of a 70 mil per kilo VO2 max effort. So it's actually, you know, relative to the whole VO2 max, it's only small, I understand, uh, metabo and reflex and maybe redirection of blood to the muscles. But there was, if I remember correctly from Rob's work, substantial performance benefit when these people actually ran a time trial. You got the right. time trial easier? Uh, Just because it's that practical side of it. Like, that's great right. Great lab work, but not, oh, very interested in the practical consequences. Sure, sure. And with this group of athletes, we actually don't have, we don't have a time trial performance. Typically, you know, with, with, uh, with these studies that we've been doing lately, um, 
you know, these guys are actually gearing up for comp for actual competition, so they can't really adjust their training schedule. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, I would make I would make the argument that it would it'd be important to to know the work of the changes in the work of breathing, as you said with the metabo reflex. Um, I think that's sort of uh, you know that's where we'll see the biggest changes in terms of locomotor muscle availability. Um, translating to an in improvement in performance, for sure. Yeah. I think time has come to close this in. Oh, oh, so <laughs> oh hello. Uh, you said that at competition. And you write that competition part down to that performance measure. That's a really good question. And actually, I think Dr. Chapman would be able to comment uh, better than I would on that. If, if you want to go ahead and. Well, that, that was a slide we showed uh, uh, of the athletes who competed at Mount Sac and Stanford. Uh, that was that's the same subject group that uh, yeah. they they did uh, two of them had PRs of the four and then all of them ran faster even on the second day so but we didn't have a pre camp measure to look at changes.